Wow, do we have a stream for today. This one is jam-packed. And the first story is going to be super-sized, but there was so much other stuff going on. Usually I would just do a Golden Globes breakdown, but because there's so much other stuff in the news, we're going for it. So before we get started, though, I see some of you have already gifted some memberships. That's so generous of you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, and of course, it's the first stream the first stream of the of the week, so I'm going to be gifting five memberships myself. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, let's see here. I do this at the beginning of every week. If you would like a gifted membership, YouTube chooses them based on who interacts the most with this channel. So if you're a subscriber, if you've been a previous member, if you like the videos, if you leave comments, it uh, that's how it decides who to give memberships to. Uh, all right, I'm glad you guys like my shirt. It's a new shirt. Breaking out some new shirts. I try to keep it interesting. Uh, oh, thank you, Sensation. So since we have so much to go through, I'm going to keep an eye on your comments. Uh, but remember, I'm going to, I'll really uh, answer them and pay attention to your, even your super chats at the end of each section. Uh, hey, Paul, thank you for gifting some memberships. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, if you're going to be using your monthly super chat or et cetera, you know, when I'll be able to <clears throat> really take a look at it. But we have a lot to discuss. Let me ask you this first. I'll do a poll. I know you guys love the polls. Polly, poll, poll. Who watched the Golden Globes last night? Uh, I did. Uh, kept an eye on it. didn't pay attention. Okay, so you can vote in that as we talk. Okay? So anyone can vote in a poll, by the way. You don't have to be a member to vote in a poll. Uh, members can join in the chat, but anyone watching can vote in the poll. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for gifting some memberships. Okay. Now, from now on, if you gift some memberships, I certainly appreciate it, but I won't be able to say anything because I'm going to be, I'm going to be cooking. I'm putting my chef's hat on. Let's go. All right. So I got graphics. I got tons of graphics. All right. Story number one. Boop. So here we go. Let me move that to the back, actually. Okay. Golden Globes. There's the scorecard. All right. Oppenheimer was the big winner. It's only five. It wasn't a total shutout. I tell you, they like to spread, spread the love around. And here they have done just that. As you can see for film, uh, five wins went to Oppenheimer, then two for Anatomy of a Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, and Poor Things, and then The Boy and the Heron and Killers of the Flower Moon each got one. A couple of other movies, you know, got shut out, like Maestro. You know, not surprising. Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, that's the basic breakdown for the films. And then with shows, Succession had four, the Bear 3 and uh, Beef as well, uh, my favorite shows of the year. The Crown got one and Ricky Gervais got one. So, you know, uh, you know there, I think that, you know, there were a couple of like, you know, I think you could say there are big winners with Oppenheimer and Poor Things because they won the two best picture categories, uh, drama and comedy musical. Uh, but I think, you know, to the most, to, for the most part, the love was spread around. So where I want to start with is, is this a sign of things to come. Is this, you know, are we on are we on the march to Oscar? Yes and no. You know, in the past, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, who formerly used to run this event before it was purchased by Pensk Media, which owns all the trades. The Golden Globes is now run by uh, the company that uh, it's through Dick Clark Productions, but that's owned by the, the parent company owns the Hollywood Reporter, Deadline and Variety. Uh, and so they now are the company behind the Globes. Uh, and so you have journalists still voting. Now, in the past, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association was a small group, and they were pretty good at having, like, you know, their, their thumb on their, or their finger on the pulse of Hollywood. And a lot of the things that they gave awards to would definitely get an award down the line. Uh, I think it's partly because they, Hollywood Foreign Press Association, you know, again, as I said, knew very much what everybody was talking about and how things were trending. And then also I think there's momentum, which is a big part of why I think everybody showed up last night, even though, even though the Golden Globes were supposed to be canceled. Everybody wants that momentum because they want the award. So it's very important for them to, to be there. 
So I think, you know, the, the awards help in, in that regard. But the, the really big award shows to look out for are SAG, DGA, the WGA, you know, the Actors, Directors, and Writers Guilds, and then also BAFTA, Across the Pond, the UK Academy Awards, because that's where you have overlap with actual Academy voters. Uh, so that's really, really important. Uh, now, so, okay, so uh, let's see here. Let me close this poll before we uh, get on to the next topic here. Oh, that's right, Daniel, the PGA as well. <clears throat> I, I didn't mention them. That's the Producers Guild of America. That's also very important. Pay attention to the Guild Awards. Uh, so 40% of you didn't even pay attention at all. Well, I'm glad to keep you up to date. 33% uh, of you kept an eye on it, and only a quarter of you watched. So we'll see. We'll see what the what the viewer the ratings are like. I thought they might come out before I did this live stream, but they have not come out yet. So we'll probably just discuss them on tomorrow's stream. All right. So uh, obviously the big question is Oppenheimer versus Barbie. Barbenheimer lives. Uh, now I, as you know, was really rooting for Barbie, and I know a number of you were, uh, uh, you know, also Team Barbie. But I know a lot of you really prefer Oppenheimer. And I was talking to an industry friend of mine, which is why this didn't totally surprise me. Because an industry friend of mine said that, you know, Oppenheimer was really an important show. Uh, I mean, an important, uh, I got distracted by some of your comments there. Poke, I love your enthusiasm, but make sure you don't spam because you don't want to ruin the, the experience for others in the chat. All right, so anyway, uh, my friend said, my industry friend said that, well, they thought Barbie was a good film. They didn't really like Barbie as much as I did. But they said that Oppenheimer was the kind of film that Hollywood wants to be known for. I also think you're seeing a backlash against, you know, IP-driven films. Uh, although I told you I think Christopher Nolan has turned himself into an IP. Uh, but I think Hollywood would rather have that. Uh, I also think that it's, uh, you know, uh, a, something of an award for Christopher Nolan's career and what he's accomplished. And when I think of it in that regard, I'm okay with it. I'm like, yeah, he is an incredible force in the entertainment industry. Uh, he should have awards. It's like Alfred Hitchcock never won a Best Director Oscar, which is nuts. So you certainly don't want that to happen to, to Nolan. Uh, and so... Uh, and so I think this is, you know, and also drama and, and things that don't have sequels, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's very much what I think the industry want, one of the reasons they're pushing Oppenheimer. And I think maybe to some degree, poor things. Now, I thought Barbie was very important, uh, but my, as I told you, my friend didn't agree. Uh, you, I, would do, I do think it's also interesting that Universal is the studio behind Oppenheimer. And Universal has a very good, good awards office. And of course, uh, Nolan for years, his whole career, in fact, for the most part, was over at Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers is running Barbie's campaign. And you know, you can see Barbie didn't get a lot. So it's tough to run an awards campaign. So you need a, you need, you need a, a, an awards office that has the connections, that has a track record of getting nominations and wins for their films, because it means they know what they're doing. So Universal did a very good job in 1917, as you might recall. That won a bunch of awards the same year. I think it was the same year that Dunkirk came out. It was really funny to see Sam Mendes win all these awards right in Nolan's face, basically copying Nolan. Uh, and then also I want to point out that Fox Searchlight, now known as Searchlight, is also incredibly good at getting awards. And of course, that is a poor, that's, their film this year is Poor Things. So I think you also have to really recognize, and this is something that, you know, should be thought of when people are deciding where to put their awards contender movies, where to make them. Poke, if you keep spamming, I'm going to have to put you in a timeout, and I really don't want to do it, okay? So I think, I think you're doing a good job. I, I don't see you there, so I think you're doing good. Uh, all right, so I think, you know, that's important to pay attention to the fact that, you know, F Searchlight, Universal, I didn't poke block Poke. I think Poke's just being good. Uh, Poke, don't feel bad about this. You're loved. You're loved, Poke. You're loved. Okay. So I also want to point out, for those of you who like Barbie, like myself, okay, Barbie's in very good company. The Dark Knight got snubbed. Avatar got snubbed. Both versions. The original of the color purple. It happens. Uh, I did feel kind of bad for uh, Margot Robbie and company sitting there, being invited to the party, and then kind of getting laughed at. And I think that's a little bit, you know, Joe Coy, unfortunately, set that tone with the opener of the show. But let's, you know, the person I want to start out with, actually, hold on. The person I want to start out with, here we go. 
is Will Ferrell. Let me pick, fix this. I wanted you to be able to read the scorecards. Let me make these pictures more manageable. Okay. Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell and Kristen Wiig had a very funny bit. And, what, and one of the things that Will Ferrell said, which I thought was hilarious, is that he said it in jest. But he said, the Golden Globes haven't changed at all. And I thought that was funny because it, for a large part, it was true. The Golden Globes had not changed. They were almost exactly the same awards show. Uh, everyone came back. It was as if nothing had happened. And again, we'll see what the ratings look like. It was, it was on after football, so the idea was that everybody who was watching football would keep watching the Golden Globes, although I think that's a really big ask for a lot of football fans. Uh, so it, it was exactly the same as the former Golden Globes, but with one crucial difference. It wasn't as fun. I think that the show was too tame, uh, and I thought that it was moving extremely fast. I thought the pace was ridiculous. Uh, I know they wanted to fit in their three-hour time window, but it run over if this is the alternative. Uh, speeches, they, when they got up to the stage, because it was so hard to navigate the tables in that room, people were getting up there saying, I've got 20 seconds to say something. And, you know, I think sometimes that's a blessing because sometimes some of the speeches can get a little long-winded. But, you know, I think it keeps... It, it denies the, the brilliant acceptance speech. I think there were glimpses here and there. Uh, Ayo Edabiri's comment about assistance was, was fantastic. Uh, but there just, wa there just wasn't enough space to let that happen. Uh, and so I had a problem with that. I thought some of the presenter bits were good. I thought that Jared Leto was funny making fun of himself. Uh, and someone pointed out that it, towards the end of the evening, he was at a table all by himself, which I'm sure was for an innocent reason, but it sure was hilarious to think that he drove everybody away from the table. You'd think he would have moved tables, although maybe he's just comfortable with himself. Uh, I thought that uh, Carrie Russell and Ray Romano had a very good bit, although I think it underscored uh, that Hollywood maybe isn't as always as honest in how Hollywood operates, and so I don't know if that's something they want to call attention to. Uh, and then also I thought that the stuff with the Spider-Verse actors was a good idea for a bit where they had studio executives write their open, their, their, uh, their intro, but you know, I don't think the jokes were funny enough. So I thought it was a good setup though. But then of course, we got to talk about Joe Coy. Probably the worst hosting I've ever seen on an awards show. Uh, I think it'll go down in history. Uh, I've never seen someone bomb so bad, so aggressively. Uh, usually, maybe they weren't pouring the liquor as much as they usually do during the Globes, but usually you'll get polite laughs from the audience. Stone faces, but of course the winner is by far Taylor Swift. That was fantastic. I think Taylor Swift has had enough. We were on the verge of a Will Smith, Chris Rock moment here, because uh, Taylor Swift, I think, has had just had enough of, you know, people, uh, you know, I don't think she likes the way, you know, the discourse around her is going. Uh, and so I thought her reaction was, I think a lot of us, I think particularly women, could really relate to Taylor Swift's reaction. Uh, I thought that, uh, although I want to say on a side point, I saw that some... I saw that some, some reviews of the Globes pointed out that the old Hollywood Foreign Press Association would have made sure that Taylor Swift won, that she won the box office award. And, the, and some people felt that the whole reason they even had that category was to get Taylor Swift to the Golden Globes. And I thought that, I mean, we'll talk about that category when we get to it. Um, it makes no sense to me, really. Uh, but um, I thought, was that why they did it? And then why not give it to her then? Uh, you know, maybe... They maybe the the producers, but then the people who are members of the organization didn't play along with the votes, and they were just stuck. Uh, but yeah, it was a little weird to have her there, and then she didn't. She wasn't even a presenter, and she didn't even go up on stage. So, uh, but she certainly, even just sitting at a table, got a ton of attention, uh, which is a double-edged. You know, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and Taylor Swift is, you know, having a, a, you know, she's, I think she's navigating it extremely well. And this was, I think she handled herself really well. She made it clear she wasn't happy, but she didn't, you know, she didn't, uh, you know, do anything like Will Smith did, you know, crossing a line. Uh, so, uh, some of you are saying, by the way, that you think that James Franco and Anne Hathaway were worse. I think they were, I think they were certainly very awkward as hosts of the Oscars, but I felt that Joe Coy was worse. I really did feel that he was worse. I felt that his joke about Barbie, to belittle the film like that, it was just the beginning of a very bad night for Barbie. And perhaps if he hadn't made those jokes, um, 
maybe it wouldn't have seemed as bad for Barbie. Uh, I think because after the past few weeks, they've been playing up Barbie so much. And I think that they've really been talking about how intellectual it is and the strong choices they made and explaining them. And then to still be treated like the dumb blonde at the party, I think it was really devastating. I, I, re I mean, I felt very bad about it. I felt really, really bad. Uh, R.A. says that Joe Coy is maybe roasting what... He's not a very good roaster, though. A good roaster, you're insulted and annoyed, but you're like, what can I say? You got me. Uh, but I didn't think he was a good roaster. I think he went for low-hanging fruit, and I think it was just really insulting, and I think that uh, it was just really bad. I think Ricky Gervais is an excellent roaster. I mean, you, can't, you can get a little angry, but you're like, you know... I didn't even see the very... I had to go back and watch the beginning of his monologue because uh, CBS football ran over. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. All right, so we're going to now go to the awards, all right? And I'm going to go through it in the order that the awards were given because I want to also kind of walk you through my mental status as the show progressed, okay? All right, so we're going to start off with Divine Joy Randolph. She was the first award of the night. We all knew it was between her and Danielle Brooks, and she won. And I believe that uh, Divine Joy Randolph is going to win every single Best Supporting Actress award. Uh, they don't split the Best Supporting into drama or comedy. It's just a catch-all category. Uh, and while I really loved Danielle Brooks, uh, I feel that Divine Joy Randolph is certainly uh, a one, did a, does a wonderful job in the holdovers, and I'm very happy for her. Uh, thanks, Lawson, for gifting those memberships. Uh, but yeah, so I thought, you know, this was the first award of the night, and everything seemed to be going as expected because, you know, she's, just, she's been winning a lot so far. It's really been between her and Danielle Brooks. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's right. She's a fellow Randolph. And I think that um, she's just going to continue to win. I think she'll win the Oscar as well. Uh, all right. Then next, Robert Downey Jr. By the way, I just want to talk about the stage. These are my own photos that I took. You can see some of my Christmas decorations at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I was going to use the Golden Globes graphics that they put up during the night, but they were using stock photos of the winners instead of from the, it just didn't have the same energy and it didn't give you a feel for the winner or the film that they were in. So I decided to use my own picks and I thought that the room looked great. I wish that screen was a little bit more visible and easier to get on screen, but it, well, it was a nice look. I liked it. I liked the graphics, although whoever was doing the lower third did an awful job. The, sometimes the lower third never even came up or it came up at the last minute and you're like put the lower third up man so Robert Downey Jr. when you think of this maybe as a career award then maybe I get it I thought I mean I know some of you loved him in this and hey what, I'll take whatever Robert Downey Jr. love I can get for some reason during you know when uh, Civil War came out all of Marvel fandom decided to turn on Tony Stark and I felt really awful about it I was like, he had held up the Marvel Cinematic Universe since day one uh, and worked really hard on it and was very, really advocated for it and gave it a lot of credibility. Uh, and then everybody just turned on him. Although I think it's funny he's still wearing the Tony Stark glasses because he really is to some degree Tony Stark. Juan Gabriel, it might be his third Golden Globe, but I do believe he's never won an Oscar. And so I think that this is why he probably will win the Oscar. Uh, I think it's maybe potentially a career award. Remember, sometimes they just decide it's your turn. That's what happened with Jeff Bridges in Crazy Heart. They were like, it's Jeff Bridges' turn. And I think you might see that happen with a number of, a couple of actors, uh, you know, a couple of things. So, I mean, but some of you really liked his performance here. And so, uh, again, I'm not mad at it. That's right, Jamie Lee Curtis was very much a career award. You know, people felt it's Jamie Lee Curtis's turn. Although, what about Angela Bassett's turn? Uh, but they decided to go with Jamie Lee Curtis. So it's fine. It's fine. I think Ryan Gosling, I hate to see his role belittled. Uh, I would rather, and I, you know, I did not see May, December, but I know that Charles Melton's getting a lot of love. This is perhaps more, more devastating for him because his, you know, transitioning to serious actor is very important. On, uh, I think, I hope he gets at least one win at one of these shows. It would be horrible if he was totally shut out. Uh, so I'll just instead say this was a ridiculously strong category. And I do like Robert Downey Jr., so I'm happy to see him take, uh, take the award. All right, then it went over to limited series. And Beef, oh, Beef was sweeping. Beef won for Ali Wong. And by the way, one of you pointed out that she was there with Bill Hader as her date, who she's currently seeing. And so she gave him a big smooch before she went up on stage. 
But then in her acceptance speech, she, she thanked her ex-husband for being such a good co-parent, which she said allowed her to have the career that she did. I loved that. I thought that was great. I'm glad she has such a good relationship with her ex-husband, particularly because they're co-parenting. And I thought that was a really important thing to acknowledge, you know, for women and anybody, anyone, you know, I think dads don't get enough credit, which is why I think the, the, the which is why I think the, the trend of dads in, in media and entertainment is really wonderful because I think it's high time we realize that dads love their kids just as much and want to be in their lives. You know, there's bad dads and bad moms, but there are good dads and good moms. And so I think it's um, really great uh, that, you know, that she had someone there to help her be able to have a family and still work very hard. It's very difficult. The entertainment industry is a business that is really a roller coaster of a ride that has crazy hours. Uh, it's emotionally taxing. And, you know, sometimes you have to go away and travel for a long time and be away from your family, you know, day and night. And, you know, I, so I think, you know, it was really, I thought it was really great that she said that. I'm a big Ali Wong fan. And then sure enough, right after Steven Yoon, took uh, Best Actor in a Limited Series. And he, by the way, also gave a shout out to, to his uh, children, or I think his, I think his daughter, right? But I thought that was really nice. Uh, I think that, you know, he just recently, unfortunately, had to walk away from Thunderbolts, uh, and I'm really glad that he won this. Uh, sorry that the, the, the graphics, I think they're a little bit wonky, but you can still read that. Uh, I took these, unfortunately, with my live camera, and so I had to transition them all to JPEG. JPEG. So, but yeah, so I think that he'll definitely continue to work. He's now an award-winning actor. He's certainly been nominated before. And so I'm very, I think it's great. I'm really glad that he won. Uh, and he deserves to for, for that. Uh, I know that that show has some controversy behind it. Same with The Holdovers. Uh, but I think that uh, it's really complex. You know, I think we're going to have to take a complex. I think, I think that with the, when it comes to beef, I think if they bring back David Cho for season two, if they make it, that's, that's where you have a real problem. I think that would be really, really bad. Uh, so let's see what they do. Hopefully they can navigate that successfully. But I wouldn't write off the show because of that. Uh, all right, next up, Elizabeth Debicki for The Crown. Oh, so deserved. I think she has not gotten anywhere near the, um, the attention that she deserves for her portrayal of Princess Diana. Uh, she, I have never really gotten Princess Diana, you know, the craze. Uh, and I think I've only had like a surface level knowledge of it, but I think that because of this, particularly the final episodes, the first four episodes of season six, I really, really understood more where Diana was coming from. And I think it just gave so much more nuance. And I think it was just same with, I felt with the Pam and Tommy, uh, thing where, uh, Lily James played Pamela Anderson. I thought that these shows were amazing gifts to these women, uh, which, you know, I think women so often are vilified and not given, you know, the benefit of the doubt and no one bothers to see their perspective or what it's like for them uh, in, pop, in, you know, in, in, pop, in popular culture and in the news cycle. And I just think that it's a great, I'm so happy to see this trend where I think their positions are being better explained. And she did an amazing job. I didn't even see Elizabeth Debicki. I saw Princess Diana. So I'm just absolutely thrilled that she won. All right, next up, Matthew Mc, uh, McFadden. You guys said the D goes early. Matthew McFadden won Best Supporting Actor for Television for Succession. Uh, by the way, just like with the supporting actor categories in film, the supporting actor categories for TV are not divided either. You know, it's just one catch-all. So Tom, that's right, Tom, although he kind of gave a major spoiler for the show, which I thought was, uh, I was like, whoa, some people might not have watched Succession, Tom. I thought they were very good avoiding spoilers with the clips from Succession season four. I was like, that was great. But I'm so glad that he won. Uh, he's been going, he's, he won the Emmy. He's going to keep, he, he'll win. Um, so he's, I don't know if he's up for the Emmy. I think he's still up. The Emmys, by the way, are a week from today. So we're going to be doing a lot of awards uh, discussions. But I'm really, really glad uh, that he won. I think his Tom was just an incredible character brought to life by him. Uh, that's right. He's in Deadpool 3, Danny. As I've said before, I believe he's a TVA agent, uh, which I think is a great, great choice for him. Uh, and also, I'm really glad that a lot of cases, the, you know, the partners of these people won as well. So you're going to see that. Uh, his partner on the show won, you know, uh, Sarah Snook, and then you'll see for the bear. Both those partners won as well, and I think that's really great. All right, next up, screenplay. 
Uh, there's just one category for the uh, Golden Globes. There's no original versus adapted. And Anatomy of a Fall won. Uh, this lady's stealing my look, man. <laughs> I was like, what? Talk about long lost relatives. Uh, but anyway, uh, and I, as I tweeted, I was like, I suspect that I would try and wear a suit and pants and flats to the Golden Globes. But I, I, I mean, I'd been where this woman is, but I, I think I wish that someone had talked her out of it and been like, it's the Golden Globes. You got to wear a dress. All right. So anyway, this is when I got really worried about Barbie. This is where I started to be like, Barbie, it's not looking good for you. Because this was a category I felt Barbie definitely should have won. Everyone was saying that Barbie was the best screenplay they ever read. Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach are most famous for being writers. And for this to not get it, I was shocked. By the way, I'm, I think it's funny you guys think this looks a little like me. By the way, when I was little, when I was like a kid, I looked almost exactly like this. This was very much me as a child. So that's another reason I guess I think it's very funny. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's me. Uh, all right. <laughs> so funny. I'm like, I love this lady just because we're similar. <clears throat> all right. So then Jeremy Allen White won for uh, The Bear, his second time winning in this exact category. That's like Zendaya winning back-to-back -back Emmys. They're just that good. Uh, I thought it was interesting that backstage, I think it was Access Hollywood, had a big printout of his Calvin Klein ad with him in his underwear. And his co-star, uh, Ayo Atterbury, took it away and, and hit it. And she turned it around and she said, this is a work event. That's not cool, man. I got to stand up for my family. And I was like, Ayo, if I could, it's, like, it's as if I couldn't love you more. I love her. But I have to say, I mean, that is a public campaign. Oh, it was extra. Thank you, Elliot. It is a public campaign. And uh, he did do it right before the, uh, I mean, I certainly, it came to my mind when he went up there. Uh, and I think, it, I think it was very tasteful. I mean, he's the one who decided to be in an underwear campaign. Uh, but I, I thought, I don't, I guess how I feel is I don't blame that host for bringing out the picture. I mean, I don't think I would have had a picture. I wouldn't have blamed it for ref him for referencing it. But I also agree with I, AO, I think it's fair game that she turned it around. So I thought, I thought it all worked out okay. But I think Jeremy Allen White's star is on the rise, and I'm very excited to see. You know, he's already in the Iron Claw, so I'm curious to see what he gets next. Is he short one? Maybe he'll be Wolverine. Let's start the rumors now. <laughs> uh, I think he's great. All right, so then next up. Oh, how did that happen? What the? Ah, uh, why did it get back to the middle? Hold on. Is my thing not working here? Ah, oh, one second. Are there too many pictures? Hold on, I'll just take all these other ones out that we already went through. There we go. Okay. I'm glad I can do this live on the fly. All right, so <clears throat> back to our regularly scheduled programming. Next up, Sarah Snook won for Best Actress in a Drama. And I was delighted that she did because I think that she doesn't get enough credit for what she contributes to this show. And I think it was really wonderful. You know, I was just talking about women and women being powerful. And, uh, you know, I think it's also great to underscore that women are flawed as well. And, and Shiv is a deeply flawed individual. I thought it was hilarious that for four seasons, she was like, I should be CEO. And you're like, Shiv, you are, would be a horrible CEO. I mean, she was a character who had absolutely no ability, really no business ability. But yet just because her dad was the head of this major company, she felt that she did. And you were like, you don't. I mean, it was just incredible to watch. And I think that Sarah Snook did a wonderful job uh, bringing that to life. So I, I'm really glad that she won. I'm very, very happy for her. All right, then next, uh, best series drama. Is this the right order? I'm getting a little nervous. Oh yeah, we're pretty close to the end. Okay. Then right after that, Succession. Uh, is this correct? I'm getting really nervous. Um, no, I'm missing some categories. Darn it. 
Like we didn't see Kieran Culkin. Hold on. Who also won for best actor? And we haven't done... One second. Oh, I'm so annoyed. Yeah, we have a bunch of stuff that we haven't seen. Give me a second here. Hmm. Okay. All right. Hold on. I got to add some files. I'm so sorry about this. I guess it was too many things for this. One second. We'll just go through it now the way it is. Okay. What a revolting development. Okay, best uh, for non-English language film. All right, so then it was Anatomy of a Fall one, which I'm fine with. I know some people like this film. Uh, then next up, uh, Ayo Edubiri. She won best, uh, as this was another pairing, as I said. I thought it was wonderful to see these two, uh, you know, both, uh, both leads on the bear win. Uh, Ivan Moss uh, uh, Barak, uh, Barak didn't win, best supporting, but that was a tough category. Uh, so, so this was great, very, very happy uh, that she won, and I thought her speech was wonderful. I thought her speech about thanking the assistants for answering all her crazy emails, I thought that was great. All right, then, as I said, Kieran Culkin. I'm really happy that Kieran Culkin won. Love Kieran Culkin. I think he's a really, really talented actor. You know, Macaulay Culkin's brother. He, he's fuller. He drank the Pepsi in uh, Home Alone. And I think that, uh, I don't know if he's who I would have voted for in this category, but I still think that uh, I, I'm very happy that he won. That's right. Pedro Pascal, unfortunately, didn't win, but he'll be back. Pedro Pascal was a great sport about it. Pedro Pascal apparently really injured himself. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this is, you know, succession's done. And I think that Kieran Culkin did a wonderful job uh, with his role. And he really made a lot of it. You know, you wouldn't have thought that the role would end up having the depth that it did. All right, then, so this is now out of order. We just did her. All right, Christopher Nolan, he won Best Director. Very happy for Christopher Nolan. Uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, I don't like his movie, but as I just said, he is an incredibly talented director. He certainly had a huge impact on the industry, so I can't get that angry about him winning. Do I think Greta Gerwig did a better job directing? Yes, I do. Uh, but still, um, you know, you can't get angry with somebody like this uh, winning. He's wanted it for so long. He's, it's, it, I'm, I'm curious to see what that does to his career now that he can focus on other things if he wins the Oscar. Uh, but yeah, so... So, yeah, he, does, he doesn't know how to write female characters, Danny, and I don't think he's ever going to learn. Uh, but that's fine. Maybe that's one of the reasons I don't... No, I don't think that's true. Uh, I guess I, if it constantly frustrates me, for sure, but especially because his wife is his producer, I'm like, why didn't you bring it up? 
and say that he can't write women, but I guess maybe she's fine with it. But so many people love Oppenheimer that it's like, it's fine. It's fine. Not a, you know, whatever. Very happy. Then, all right, Succession. Uh, so we're a little out of order. I apologize. So Succession won Best Drama. Totally deserved. The show is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The show is just, it's an incredibly well done show. It's just masterfully written. Uh, I think it, it totally deserves this award. It was just really one of the best shows of all time. Uh, thanks, Joey, for gifting a membership there. Uh, then, uh, so we're, we're going to go to the end of the evening, and then we're going to go double back a little bit. Sorry. All right, then Paul Giamatti ended up winning uh, Best Actor. I, I'm so annoyed that the, the thing didn't work. The stupid, uh, the, stu the, 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 I put all the pictures in order. I'm so annoyed. All right, so Paul, I'm really annoyed. All right, so Paul Giamatti, uh, he won for The Holdovers. I got to tell you, I feel like this is a career award as well. I really do. I think he's okay in The Holdovers. I've never seen him, I've, I mean, I've seen him do that so many times. Uh, I'm so upset, I got to calm down. All right. But I think in The Holdovers, Paul Giamatti played the role that he's played his entire career. And I didn't think that there was any great moment in it where I think that you're like, wow, that's the Oscar winning or awards winning speech. You're like, it's fine. So I'm not upset that Paul Giamatti won because I think he's really talented. And I think that, you know, I can see it being his time to win an Oscar. That's the only thing that I think could derail Killian Murphy, who we haven't gotten to yet, even though he won his award first in the evening. But yeah, I think, you know, that's the only thing that could derail Killian, uh, Killian Murphy. That people go, oh no, it's Cillian Murphy, right? Ah, Cillian Murphy. I think that people will be like, it's Paul Giamatti's time, perhaps. So that's the only thing that I think Murphy has to look out for. All right, that's very kind of you, C-Class. I appreciate that. All right. Then, poor thi Oh, my gosh. Uh, just when I've calmed down. Poor Things. One, this is one of the two awards at one of the night. Uh, we'll talk about Emma Stone when we get to Emma Stone. Uh, poor Things won Best Comedy or Musical. And I think many of us were shocked that it would win over Barbie. Uh, I mean, I think, I think one of the reasons this hurt in particular is that it's very similar to Barbie in terms, I guess, of like the message. And I thought that Barbie was, just did it in a much more sophisticated, successful way. Uh, whereas I think that Poor Things was a lot of posturing. Uh, to me, Poor Things is like an emperor has no clothes, in this case, literally, film. To me, and this is like the politest way I can say it, I feel there's a lot of really questionable and downright offensive and wrong things in the movie, but I think that people are overlooking it because the film postures as such an important movie. And so I think a lot of people feel, it, especially, I mean, I'm as shocked that everybody who's associated with it is. I mean, I never, when I turned it on, I never would have imagined that these caliber of actors would agree to do a show, to do a movie like this. And, uh, you know, I think that, that if, because of who's involved and because the film acts very important, I think that uh, people are just excusing things that I think on multiple levels are really bad. I think there's, uh, I think, and some, it's, I wouldn't just say it's the inappropriate factor that I, have in it, that I take issue with. And I, and I do. I think it's an X-rated NC-17 film. Uh, and I don't think that any story needs that to get its point across. Uh, but I also don't like its viewpoint of women. Uh, it's particularly mothers and daughters. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but I have a big problem with uh, what I think it says about mothers and daughters and the, you know, uh, does a daughter replace a mother? Are they the same person? To me, mothers and daughters are very much separate individuals. I mean, there's certainly a link there, uh, but that really bothers. I find that really bad. Um, uh, to me, I think it underscored some of the stuff you know, I think it, it could be used as an anti-abortion argument in some cases. You know, uh, it, it played a little into that, which bothered me. Uh, I also had a problem with cruelty to animals and people. Uh, I think the film was very cruel. And then uh, I also thought it was totally unrealistic in terms of the things that would happen in the scenarios that were presented. Uh, I think that if you're going to have a character work at a brothel, I think that you don't just be, 
I think you don't just be honest about what they would be asked to do with customers, uh, you know, in terms of gr graphicness. But I think you need to be very honest about the way often sex workers are treated by not just their customers, but by their employers, and often the things, the very bad things that happen to them, uh, particularly in Victorian era France. Uh, I saw a review that pointed out all of the things that were left out, that what that would, what would be entailed in that kind of an endeavor. Uh, and then also the ability to re-enter, uh, you know, um, the, upper, the upper class after that journey. Uh, and then also, um, you know, the character not being, and then the character was not even scarred. You know, a lot of people when we were arguing about this last night said, oh, it's actually, it's the reverse. We show you all these horrible things and you're, it's like saying, if, if you punch somebody in the face and then a police officer comes up and says, that was assault. And if you say, no, it wasn't. I punched that person in the face to show how wrong it was. Don't you all feel it was horrible once you saw it? Well, then my work is done. And then the police officer goes, oh, good job. Uh, and so I think, you know, like to me, I think that's one way to describe the movie. Uh, I also think that it could be, I think it in, maybe, I hope inadvertently makes, you know, really illustrates the, uh, the argument that some people say about maturity when talking about whether or not someone's, uh, you know, with underage stuff. And I, I feel that there's a line in the sand for a reason. Uh, and then also, uh, I'm trying not to give spoilers away. Um, and it's not, I don't know how, some people think it's funny. Oh yeah, and then at the end of the movie, uh, again, no spoilers, but I felt that she seemed not to have learned anything because she went on to do the same things to others that were done to her. And just because she did it to a guy instead, I don't see how that's supposed to be any kind of growth. Uh, and I don't think it's what we need in our, in the conversation these days. So I have lots of, lots of problems with this movies. And I'm, I'm really surprised that it would, you know, that it would be rewarded when I feel like Barbie said a lot of the same stuff, but in a really constructive, positive way. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just the way things are. So, you know, I'm not, it's like, it's fine, whatever, you know? Uh, so, so that's the, that's the case. All right. So Hector Vega, that was a good call. All right. Then Lily Gladstone, Lily Gladstone, uh, won for killers of the flower moon for uh, best actress. And she of course gave the first part of her speech, uh, in, uh, the native American language of, of her tribe. And she talked a little bit about why she chose to do that. Uh, and I thought that that really was very moving. At first I was like, oh, I want to know what you're saying. And then she explained why she was doing it that way. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's very moving. Uh, I, I think, you know, even though I didn't particularly love this film and while I had some issues with the way her role was constructed, I do think she has a great persona. I think she's certainly talented. Uh, and I would love for her to move on and get other work. And so that's the big question. You know, sometimes talent will win awards and they will not go on to work again, uh, which is very unfortunate. You know, Hollywood's like, pats, it's almost like Hollywood's patting itself on the back. So they can say, oh, look who we gave an award to. Uh, like, remember um, the actor from uh, Captain Phillips? I'm drawing a blank on his name, uh, but you know, he was winning awards and being nominated and we never saw him again, even though he was really charismatic as well and very talented. And so I hope that Lily, that's the next big hurdle for Lily Gladstone. Oh, Barack, uh, 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 Barkhead Abdi. Thank you guys, Barkhead Abdi. Love Barkhead Abdi. Uh, and he got a little thing, he got, like he got some stuff here or there, but just not enough. And uh, so that's Lily Gladstone's next hurdle to continue to work. All right, then, all right, so we're gonna do this one. This was the last award of the night and then we have a couple to catch up on. All right, so best drama, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer won. Uh, again, I don't care for this film. I have a lot of problems with it thematically and with the creative choices that Christopher Nolan made. Yet at the same time, as I said with my uh, describing my critic's choice ballot the other day on Friday, 
I, I still, you know, I can respect the craftsmanship behind the film. And I certainly can see that it was very successful. I can cert- I mean, I don't really know what doors it opened or how it changed the industry. Uh, I mean, although I don't know if Barbie will either, right? Hollywood has a really bad track record of actually learning from success. Uh, like, you know, they're, you know, like uh, Randall Park was like, you know, Barbie was successful because it's a story about women, not because it's about toys. Uh, and then also with this, you know, people were saying, oh, the drama is back. And then Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon both fell flat on their face. So I don't really know if Oppenheimer has done anything more than make Christopher Nolan very, very wealthy and gotten him a lot of awards. Uh, but, you know, that's impressive as well. And the industry really needed Barbenheimer. So I guess it's good they're at least awarding one half of it. But you know, Barbie, Barbie took so much heat in that combo to see the uh, industry kind of gang up on Barbie is kind of sad to me. I just, I feel kind of bad about it. You know, I'm like, they were both good movies. Like, let's just say they were both good movies. You not, might not have liked both of them, but it was really a team effort. And, um, to just trash Barbie like that at the same event and be like, oh yeah, well we needed to make, it's like, you know that famous saying, one for them, one for you? I feel like the awards, the Golden Globes basically said, Barbie is the one for them and Oppenheimer is the one for us. And that just really, you know, I just wish Hollywood would stop being so disdainful of the audience. Like that really continues to bother me. Uh, And I feel like it's always, and that's one of the reasons I think people don't watch awards shows because it's just no, nowhere is it more evident than during awards season. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, yeah, we had, we had that one. Oh, I, so we do, we do all of them. Am I missing some more pictures? Hold on. Yeah, we are. Hold on. Well, the, I'm not, for now on, Maybe because I have it on loop. Would that fix it, maybe? Well, who cares? I'll just take this stuff out. (sighs) All right. OBS has let me down today. All right, Killian, Cillian Murphy. I'm so happy for him. I like him personally. I do think that he held the film together, and I thought he was adorable with his wife's lipstick all over his face. He instead looks like a cute little British child, you know, and they have rosy cheeks and a nose. He looks like a little cartoon character. Uh, I thought it was charming. So uh, I was very happy to see him to see him win. I like him. I didn't, I didn't particularly feel anyone in that category was a huge standout. So I'm happy that he won. All right, we're coming along here. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I have the pictures for those anymore. On a side note, uh, there was animation. Uh, the Boy and the Heron one. I have not seen that, but I heard some of you say you actually disliked it. I was surprised to see that today. Uh, and so, I, I mean, it's fine. I don't think, you know, the, I would have preferred Spider-Verse to win or maybe one of the other films, but I, I'm not angry at a Boy and the Heron win. You can't be upset when Miyazaki wins an animation Oscar. So it's fine. It's whatever. Uh, and then also Ricky Gervais won Best Stand-Up. And I did not think he was the funniest in the group, um, but, uh, you know, you know, I guess the voters at the Golden Globes disagreed. But I thought it was a shame he wasn't there to go back on the stage because that would have been a great moment. But he wasn't there. All right. Then uh, score, Ludwig Göransson. Now, I love Ludwig Göransson. I've loved him from the beginning. I liked him before it was popular to like him. And he's won a number of awards. He won for Black Panther. He wins all the time. He won for The Mandalorian. I mean, this guy's really good. And I had, I, had, I had wanted Barbie to win because I think the score is really, really strong for Barbie. But as Oppenheimer went, won multiple awards during the evening and they played the Oppenheimer score, I was like, you know, that's pretty good. You know, they were like, do, do, you know, and I can't, I, 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 it was just really good and it was very unique. And I was like, oh, that's, that's actually pretty good. So, and I can see it being used. Although I was watching the football, a football game on Saturday uh, who was it? Uh, Ravens versus Steelers. And they were playing some Barbie. Some, you know, there's some of the dance the night away in the background. I was like, they're using Barbie, the Barbie music for the NFL. So good scores live on, just like they use Pirates of the Caribbean constantly everywhere. And it's great. But this is really good. I see some use in it. And so, uh, you know, awesome. Uh, so that's good. All right. Then Billie Eilish won best song. At this point, I was so happy that Barbie won something. I didn't even care that it wasn't, jo- I'm just Ken. 
I was like, fine, whatever. As long as Barbie can put on the box Golden Globe and Oscar winner, I'm happy. Because it would be really embarrassing to have to say all the nominations it got and not be able to list any awards. So at least it wasn't a shutout. So I was like, fine, give us the trophy. Uh, I don't particularly care for this song. I don't think, I mean, I love Billie Eilish. Who doesn't? Yeah, Ken did have a bad night, David Kyle. Uh, but, uh, and I don't particularly understand, I think the song was the least compelling of any in the film. Like, I, I just did not care for it. But as soon as it dropped, everybody was like, Oscar, and I guess they were right. Because sometimes the academy and sometimes the industry just falls in love with an individual, and I think they really like Billie Eilish, which is great. And, you know, Billie Eilish has had a little bit of a tough time with a, uh, on a, uh, with a press outlet outing her, so, uh, which was super uncool. So uh, I'm happy to see her smiling and back on top so quickly. All right. All right, box office achievement. Is this the last one? Oh, no, it's not. Okay, box office achievement. What a ridiculous award. But when Barbie got, Barbie, I mean, when they were listing, by the way, there seemed to be way more nominees for this as well. But when they were listing all the nominees, I was like, man, if Barbie doesn't win this, this is, uh, some of you said it would be like, is this a vendetta against Barbie at this point? So thankfully, Barbie at least took home this award. Like, as I tweeted during the award ceremony, at first I thought this award was stupid, but now I'm just so happy that Barbie was able to get up on stage and, you know, get an award. I don't care. Uh, I don't know if I would call this a participation award, Sierra. To me, what's weird about this award is why have nominees? If you want to give an award for the best uh, box office performance, that's fine. But then don't have nominees. It should be like one, like the Cecil B. DeMille or whatever, you know, like those awards or the governors or what, you know, they give like awards out every year. And it's like, they didn't, they actually didn't, they cut them this year, but usually there's some kind of award that's like given to someone as like a celebration of them. So why not just make this a, cel a box office, you know, a nod to the box office accomplishment and then not have any, not have any uh, nominees, you know, just know who's going to win it going in. Uh, but I'm glad the Barbie won. Uh, a part of me thinks maybe another reason Taylor Swift might not have won is because she didn't include any of the studios in that deal. And uh, nobody who works for AMC is voting, so she didn't make any of those people any money. So I think that's, uh, that's part of it. Uh, but yeah, really happy for, uh, uh, for Barbie. And I thought that they were very, I thought Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie could have gone up there and been upset. They could have been bitter, but they were very gracious. And they had a very nice speech to say, and I thought that was nice. So I'm glad they got to, to go up there. All right, then Beef won Best Limited Series. Uh, this is uh, Lee Sung uh, Jin, I believe, who is, uh, took over the writing duties on Thunderbolts, which is why it was so crazy that Steven Yoon walked away because it was supposed to be a beef reunion on that movie. Uh, but anyway, he's a this is a very talented guy. I think he's, I love that it was based on a real I love that it was based on a real road rage incident that he himself experienced, uh, and I'm glad he took something negative and turned it into something positive. I thought it was just a, a fabulous show. Uh, and then, I'm, I won't spoil it, Alberto. Then The Bear won Best Comedy Series. Deserved! So happy for it. So happy. Incredible show. I, I just can't, I love that show so much. Succession, The Bear, and Beef are just incredible television. You don't get better than that. Uh, then, uh, oh, yes, that's everybody. Okay, wow, all right, so we went through the Golden Globes. I'm sorry that it's, look, that was an hour alone. All right, so does anybody have any questions or comments about this before we move on to the other two major stories of the day? Oh, yeah, Emma Stone. Why is she not in there? All right, Emma Stone. Okay, uh, my thoughts on Emma Stone. I like Emma Stone a lot. Emma Stone was extremely kind to me when I did the Zombieland 2 press junket, as you can see in the interview. And so I will always like Emma Stone and always be a supporter of her. Uh, and that's all I'll say about it. I'm happy that she won. Okay. <laughs> so any questions or comments about this? Gilberto, I talked about Joe Coy at the beginning. I think he's the worst host of all time. ES says, what do you think about The Last of Us being completely shut out? Uh, I think it was going up against Succession. 
Oh, uh, thanks, 80s model. I think it was going up against Succession. I feel it's going to have a great night at the Emmys a week from today. It already swept the uh, secondary Emmys that don't air live uh, during the telecast. Uh, so I think it's, it's fine. I'm not worried about it. And I think, you know, it got a lot of nominations, which is great. And I think hopefully going up next with seasons two and three, apparently, it'll, that's where you'll find it getting its awards. Danny says, do you think the Globes will influence the Oscars? I think it does so much in that it uh, keeps it, it gives these, these winners momentum. When people are sitting there going, who should I vote for? And they're like, not sure who to vote for. They go, well, Cillian Murphy already won. So people are probably voting for him. So I'm going to vote for him too. That's the way it works. Where you're like, I don't know who to vote for. And then you go, oh, well, let me vote. For, you know, you don't want your vote to be wasted. You don't want to just throw it out into oblivion. So you try to vote kind of like within the realm of where everybody else is voting. So then, you know, I think that's how this helps these individuals. Ah, oh, thanks, Isaac. I'm so glad. Thank you for thank you thank you all for being patient with my technical difficulties. I really appreciate it. Uh, Raphael says, feels like Barbie is getting the superhero movie treatment from Hollywood. I think so, Raphael, which is really a shame because it's not like that at all, in my opinion. I think, it, you know, uh, I think, and I, mean, and, and I think, you know, Black Panther got a lot of love uh, and won some categories. Uh, so, you know, I hope Barbie again wins some, some awards. But uh, I think, you know, I wouldn't be dismissive of certain genres. They can be really brilliant and intellectual. And it saddens me that these movies are being dismissed. And makes me a little angry. <laughs> I felt like Barbie was being picked on last night. That's just my takeaway. I know it's an emotional reaction, but that's just how I felt. And I'm being real nice about it though. Chandler Crumlin says, if Margot Robbie is one of the producer, uh, one of the popular actors, Oh, is Margot Robbie one of the popular actors that will have to work extra hard to gain awards recognition? No, she's been nominated before. Uh, so I think she'll continue to be taken seriously. Uh, but I think, you know, Margot Robbie, much like Christopher Nolan, has also been in pursuit of an Oscar. And so this is not going to do it. She's going to just have to keep trying. Rodney says, I don't think it's over yet for Barbie. I hope it can bounce back at the Critics and SAG Awards. I hope so, too. I really do. But I think once we start getting into the Guild Awards, we'll have a better picture of how the Oscars are going to go down. It's too early to tell, but I think you can't, you can't dismiss these wins. Uh, these people all definitely got a nudge last night, for sure. Let's see if the, let's see if the ratings are in before we move on to the next category. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't see him. Okay, still not up. So we'll discuss it tomorrow. I need topics for tomorrow anyway. All right, so let's move on to the next story. All right, super long stream. Buckle up. It's been an hour and we're going to keep going. All right, story number two. Boop. All right. Sad boop. Jonathan Majors. Wow. All right. Sorry, I was getting a call there. I silenced it, but my iPad was ringing in another room. Whew, what is today's like the day of technical difficulties? All right, so Jonathan Majors. It was revealed late last week that he was going to do a special first exclusive interviews with Good Morning interview with Good Morning America. And Good Morning America, by the way, is, of course, on ABC, which is owned by Disney, which right there was a little weird for everybody. They were like, didn't that company just fire him? Why are they putting him on their news network? Also, I would like to point out that you get paid for these interviews. Uh, it's actually, I don't know if an actor of Jonathan Major's caliber would, but I would think that, you know, at this point, he would be like, he would want to get paid. Ah, David, that's so generous of you. I have to take a small break. Um... You're upset that Wonka didn't get more nominations. Yeah, it was sad, David, but at least Tim Tim Timothy Chalamet was, uh, was uh, nominated. So it was, I was not. Even he knew he wasn't going to win, though. When they cut to him, he was like, I'm just enjoying my sushi dinner. All right, so back to Jonathan Majors. So 
It was so you get paid usually for these interviews, and in fact, there's usually a bidding war when there's like a news story. You know, like when there's like someone's having their 15 minutes of fame, and all the morning shows want that person. They have to have a bidding war for them. They fly them to the New York, and they put them up in a great hotel and stuff like that, and you know, they offer them some money, and so that's usually the way it goes. But I would think that considering the fact that Jonathan Majors looks like he's not going to have any employment for the long term, he probably said, "Pay me." Uh, so, uh, this morning I logged on to Twitter and I was like, I wonder if this, I wonder if it's trending. You know, I was like, I wanted to see, I was up really late with the Golden Globe, so I'd slept in a little bit. And I was like, all right, let's see how this interview went down. And I didn't see Jonathan Majors trending. So I was like, did he back out? Did he decide not to do it right after the Globes? But oh no, he decided to do it. And in fact, it was trending number one. In fact, right before we started the live stream, it was still trending number one, but it's trending number one under Coretta, for Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s wife, who uh, Jonathan Majors keeps bringing up. Just keeps, it's still trending number one, Elliot. It's still trending number one. So we'll get to that in a moment. But, so let me talk to you about the Jonathan Majors interview. So you will have to ask yourself, what would be the point of doing this interview? It's rarely a good look. Like a lot of us, I think, were thinking like getting R. Kelly flashbacks. Rarely does someone who is like totally innocent and exonerated do this interview because it's such a bad idea, I guess. So everybody was like, oh man, like we were like, I think, I think nobody would have been, nobody would have advised him to even do this interview. Johnny Depp didn't do an interview. Amber Heard has never done an interview. When you do a tell all interview, you know, you're circling the drain. And again, you'd maybe just want that cash. So the only reasons I could think to do this interview would be to offer up new information or offer maybe a different perspective on Jonathan Majors to show a side of him that wasn't coming across so far. So I'll ask, you know, that's at least I liked the interview. So we'll do another poll. I'll ask you what you thought of the interview. So what did you think of the Jonathan Majors interview? Uh, effective? No, I don't know if that's the right word. Well done. Horrible idea. And then a third option of ignored it. Like Elise, who didn't even see it. Okay. So there are your voting options while we talk about this. Now, so you think maybe show like a different perspective on Jonathan Majors for everybody to go, oh, I th now I see him differently. Like maybe that's the other way that you would do the interview, right? However, I was shocked when I watched the interview to see him just double down or triple down on the entire trial. It was more like a recap of the trial than it was anything new. And I also felt that it became clear that Jonathan Majors probably feels that his lawyer did a great job. I was like, oh, you probably think your lawyer did a great job because you're conducting yourself very much in the same manner. So that was really, really weird. Uh, it just, you know, I know that he doesn't want to admit to any wrongdoing, but then don't do the interview because it, it was, it was just, it was just, that's funny. You bring up the Cat Williams interview. Dory does voices. I think that has like 31 million views. That was an incredible interview. That just like lit the internet on fire. But then he kept bringing up Coretta Scott King, who of course had been mentioned during the trial in a recording that his ex-girlfriend had made of him where he said, he, Jonathan Major says that he was a great, he's a great man and he needs a great woman beside him, like Michelle Obama or Coretta Scott King. Now, at first, the internet reacted during the trial to the ridiculousness of saying that to a white woman and how out of touch he is. And it's just, just, just so inappropriate and just so, 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 such, a, such a disregard to those two women that it was just really bizarre. Uh, then he continued to say it during this interview because they asked him about it. And he said that his new girlfriend, Megan Good, that Megan Good was his Coretta. And he brought it up again. And the fact that Jonathan Majors feels that he is on par with Martin Luther King Jr. or Barack Obama when he is just an actor. And we love actors. This is a movie news channel. We love actors. But it's absolutely delusional for him to think that he is anywhere on that level. And what it does is it makes you feel that he's at best not reliable and at worst dangerous because he's just so 
out of touch with reality. And when someone is like that, they're unpredictable and they could do anything at any moment. And I think that that was a really bad look for him. Christian Madrano says that doing it with GMA puts him in the same category as uh, Chris Brown and R. Kelly. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you got to think about the company that you would be in. So let's see. And also, if he's so deluded about, you know, who he is and his importance to the world, well, then maybe he's lying to himself about maybe what he did. Uh, it was just really a bad interview. So let me close the poll here. 62% of you ignored it. 29% of you thought it was a horrible idea, and 8% of you thought that it was well done. That's not bad, 8%. I would think it would be like 1%. Uh, I think, I'm wondering now, I thought maybe he would just fade away, but seeing how he conducted himself during this interview makes me wonder just how much lower he's going to go. Like, are we going to see Jonathan Majors like on The Masked Singer at some point? Like that's, like, that's what I started to feel when I watched it. It was just like, what's happening? Or Kanye West is a, that's an unfortunate comparison, Klaus. But I, now that you say it, I think there's at least some cachet in Kanye West. Kanye West, you know, hasn't totally, well, I think, I mean, he still gets some attention, but I could see him teaming up with Kanye. So uh, let's just see what he decides to do. Uh, I think the best thing is to go away for a while at the very least. Um, but I don't have very much faith in that based on how he conducted himself during that interview. Uh, all right, so does anybody have any questions or comments about this story? Yeah, Platinum Diva, I think, I mean, I would say you would think that Jonathan Majors would see the backlash to the Coretta comments that happened today, but again, he seems out of touch with reality. So I don't know if he would see that and then be like, oh, I should stop bringing that up. The guy, Ty, says, so you feel things would have gone better if he'd admitted what he did and apologized to his ex and the public. No, I think he doesn't want to go to jail. I don't think, I'm not saying he should have confessed to anything, but I think that if he was going to go on there, I think more of a focus should have been on like, well, what are you, what's different? Why should anybody watch this interview besides to watch you just go down in flames? And I think that he might have, he took, I think the only culpability he took was that he didn't break up with, the, with his ex-girlfriend, um, you know, when he felt he was done with the relationship. And I think there's some lesson to that. You know, don't stay in a relationship because it's just going to blow up in your face to some degree. Um, but I think, like, I think it would have been better to talk about, the, I think, and okay, this is what I would have done. I feel like I'm Jonathan Major's publicist, and he just asked me that question. Well, what are we going to say on the interview? And I'd say, all right, Jonathan, this is what we came up with. You're going to say that it's very clear to you at the very least, that there is some kind of, you're not connecting with, with everybody else, that people are seeing a different version of you. And so that's something that you need to work on, uh, not only with self-reflection, but you need to listen. It's like, uh, and, and try to get some help. That he's going to go to counseling, that, you know, I think he should say, he, even if he wants to maintain that he didn't have, he didn't hurt her at all, I mean, what about the text messages, which they didn't bring up in the interview, which I thought was very interesting when he told her he didn't want her to go to the hospital for her head injury. I think he just should have said, you know, he needs to look inward. He needs to recalibrate. He needs to learn. And um, he clearly made a mistake because look at the result. You don't get a result like this if something wasn't wrong. Thanks, foreign fool. A platinum diva, I, I agree. All right, 
I don't see, t I think you guys are ready to move on to the next story. <clears throat> Lisa says, I feel like no matter what he would have said, people weren't going to accept it. It's a lose-lose. That's also a fair comment, Lisa, and I think that's interesting considering you felt the interview was well done. But then maybe he shouldn't have done the interview. Maybe it was the timing was too soon. So I just think that the interview seemed to make it look, it's, it, just, it, it just it's made it seem like everything that was being said about him was true. Uh, and he's had some people who were supporting him, but as some of you are saying, he still had some supporters, but I feel he might have lost a lot of them with this interview. Let me ask that, okay? Do you support Jonathan Majors? No? Yes? And then I think we need a, uh, I need a break. So you're not saying he can't maybe come back. So I need, you, you need a break from him to regroup. So any, by the way, anyone can vote in a poll. Uh, only members can participate in the chat, but anyone can vote in a poll. I agree, Platinum Diva. I think one of the reasons the world is very angry right now is people are just like enough. They've had enough of everything and things aren't changing. Danny, I agree. I have really enjoyed Jonathan Major's professional acting. I think his work has been quite good. Barbara Seville says the Coretta thing was so out of pocket. Uh, he showed his narcissism and self-importance. Yeah. I think that was, I, I told you, it made me feel like he probably, I mean, I'm not, we've all been wondering why he's had the lawyer that he's had. And now I think when you actually talk to him, you're like, he probably loves his lawyer and thinks he has the best lawyer ever, even though we're all like, your lawyer is awful. SMR Goose says, I believe in redemption, but he still has to show growth first. I would agree with that. I would also say that prior to this interview, it seemed like it was just a toxic relationship that was really unfortunate. But again, he made himself seem a little bit more dangerous with this interview. Hey, not modern uh, art uh, painter. Thank you for gifting five memberships. So I think that it just actually was made things worse. Lisa says, Grace, you were one of the first ones on the Jonathan Majors train. I was, I was a fan since the first time I saw him in his very first role. Uh, in that, uh, I for, uh, oh, I forget the name of the movie with Christian Bale. It was his very first role. And I was like, that guy is, is a brilliant actor. Uh, and I think that, I guess how I feel is that I feel like he could work his way. I, I, I guess prior to the interview, I felt maybe he could work his way back. But after the interview, I don't know. I, I think that, it, Hostiles, thank you, Hostiles, great movie. Now, as I said, I'm a little bit concerned. But I do think that his work is phenomenal as an actor. All right, so I'm going to close the poll, and then we'll move on to the final story before we do the Ask Me Anything portion of the stream. 52% of you don't support him, but that's not bad. Only 50-50, basically. So that shows that he could come back if he just, he really has to be careful. And I think he really desperately needs a publicist. Uh, and not, if he has one, not the new one that he currently has. 33% uh, of you need a break. And I would put myself in that group. Um, so 33%, so you need, you need a break to regroup. And then 14% uh, of you do support him. But still, that's about 50-50. And so there's a way back from that. I just really hope that he just doesn't just go out of control. And I think this interview was uh, a concern about that. Uh, all right, so final story of the day. All right. Boom, baby. So yesterday I talked about the color purple controversy and I put the headlines up there during movie math, but some of you um, said you had not heard of it. So I thought I should explain it to you, uh, especially because it's a little complex and I think some people don't quite understand exactly why it's an issue. 
All right, so Taraji P. Henson, this is the actual, one of the actual interviews. This was held by The Hollywood Reporter. It's an awards screening and interview to try and get votes for The Color Purple. Uh, but as I said yesterday on Movie Math, it's gone from talking about the movie itself to how everybody in the movie was mistreated. But yet when you hear about how they were mis mistreated, you feel like it does deserve attention. So I'm going to talk to you about it, and then you know you, we can discuss it a little bit further. <clears throat> so Taraji P. Henson started, she got the ball rolling, first talking about the inequity of her salary. And she had a great line, the math ain't mathin'. And that was a great headline. You were like, wow, that's phenomenal. Like, a she did a great job. Like I, like, I don't know if she has a publicist or not, because the second thing that she said was that after she was on Empire's Cookie and was like a household name, she fired all of her, her whole team, all, everybody you know, like agent, manager, publicist. She made it seem like she just cleaned house because she was very upset that she wasn't able to build on that success, which is understandable. She said, you know, you got, they had nothing lined up except for a cookie spinoff. And then the cookie spinoff she was presented with, she felt wasn't good enough quality. But then she said, where are her endorsements? You know, I love that she said her character was named Cookie for Pete's sake. Why wasn't she getting some kind of endorsements for cookies? Uh, it was right around then that Megan Thee Stallion was getting endorsement deal after endorsement deal when this came out. And I was like, this must be driving Taraji P. Henson crazy. But, you know, she was like, how could she be on such a hit show and get nothing out of it? And I thought that was a fair point. And she had the guts to fire her entire team. But I hope she hired new people because that's who usually would be dealing with these things. And it seems to me that they are not. She maybe doesn't have anybody. Some actors will choose to be represented by themselves, and they'll just have a lawyer to negotiate their contracts. Because they might say, why should I pay someone 10%? Sometimes agents and managers don't do that much, and it can be frustrating to have to give them a chunk of your money. But when this stuff happens, when the shit hits the fan, that's why you paid someone 10%. It all comes back. That investment pays off. Because if you're upset, this is a, like, I've told you the story before. Ben Crosby was not a very nice man. He was a tough guy, but he had a public image to maintain. As I've said many times, huddle, huddle, ho. So he would have agents and managers who would act for him. And they would go in there and they would demand. They say, Bing doesn't like this. And Bing wants this. And Bing's unhappy. Bing, 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 bing boom. And that's what your agent and manager, and your, oh, hopefully maybe, I guess your lawyer does it. You should not have to do it yourself because then everybody gets upset with you. But that, the whole reason you have an agent or manager is they say, oh, but we're, the agent and manager is demanding it. You're, and then the actor comes in and goes, oh, you know how agents and managers are. They're so difficult. What can you do? But back behind the scenes, you know, you're like, thanks for getting me my stuff. Like, that's the way it works. That's what being an, the, the whole, um, Ben Crosby wasn't like evil, but he, you know, he was a tough guy. He was a tough businessman, but he wanted to maintain the illusion that he was a sweetheart and he was a softy. And so he went through his team. But it sounds to me like Taraji P. Henson maybe doesn't have a team because she's having to fight all these fights for herself. And, you know, she, you know, that's right, SMR Goose. That's a great way to put it. You want to keep your hands clean. So these are the people who get their hands dirty for you. So those are the things that Taraji P. Henson was talking about first. But then she started talking, so it was just in regards to her. But then she started to talk about how everybody on the cast was not being well treated. And then it started to get really bad. So the first story that she shared was that she was said that typically on any big production, uh, you have a driver who will drive the actors and uh, often other people on the crew and cast and crew back to the hotel. Because you're working very long hours, over 12-hour days sometimes, and you often break very late at night. And so you're not really in a good mental state. You're exhausted. And also, it's, it's late hours. You're in rural areas for the color purple. They were filming in a lot of rural areas down south. And so at 1 in the morning, you don't want to be stuck in a car by yourself driving yourself home. Now, if the production doesn't have a lot of money, sometimes actors will share cars. But they still have a driver. But on the color purple, Taraji P. Henson says that they were given rental cars and told to drive themselves. That, I can't even, this, that's so bad that I can't even imagine anyone being asked to do that. Like, it's that bizarre. Like, when she said that's what they said to her, I mean, it must have been shocking when it actually happened to that cast, to have the production hand them the keys to a rental car and say, you're responsible for getting, for getting to and from set. I mean, it's just incredible. It's just shocking. Also, from an insurance perspective, if something happens to the actors when they're driving 
an accident or worse, you know, how are you going to keep filming? Because they're not going to be available to do their scenes. So that right there was like, you're like, that's just shocking. Like, you just don't even know what to say. It's like, again, again, it's so bizarre and it's such an industry standard that I would never even imagine that it would happen. All right, then, then when during this uh, discussion, Danielle Brooks shared a news story because apparently now everybody, the floodgates are open. And uh, Danielle Brooks said when they were doing the uh, rehearsals for The Color Purple, every movie, before it starts filming, they'll do like a table read and they'll maybe block out some scenes. So they're doing rehearsals. They're not in costume. They're not on set, but they're doing rehearsals. And they're, they've really started the production. And they're acting. They have to get into a certain place. They have to get into that headspace. You know, they have to think about things. They have to decompress. You know, sometimes things, they're long. It's a long, grueling day. And uh, Daniel Brooks revealed that not a one single person had a dressing room during the rehearsals and they were not provided with food. Again, I don't even know what to say to that because you would never think that would happen. Now, some of you might be like, oh, boo-hoo, they didn't have a dressing room or food. Can you imagine doing like a 12 hour day of rehearsals and they just all corral you in the same room? And you're like, how long, I mean, that's gonna get awkward and weird and you're supposed to be doing your prep for your art, for your work. Like think about how, like The Color Purple is an intense film. So you're trying to get into a headspace, and all the other cast members are just either looking at you or they're doing their same work right next to you. I mean, that's just so bizarre. Why wouldn't you get a rehearsal space like a class, like you can do it at a school or a hotel, and then you easily can send people back to their spaces. Like that's just so bizarre. I mean, this is something that could be headed off very easily and not to provide food. I mean, and so Taraji P. Henson said she called up Oprah and Oprah fixed it. Now Oprah there, by the way, is on the right, sitting there in the white suit. And so Oprah has to sit and listen to all this because she's the executive producer. And people have pointed out that everyone's zeroing in on Oprah, but what about Steven Spielberg and Quincy Jones who also produced this movie? Aren't they also responsible? And then some people are pointing out that Oprah, well, I think she's a producer. I don't even think she's an executive producer. And that means she knows what's going on. I mean, if she, does, she should, I mean, I don't think we should, you know, I was surprised to find out how many people seem to have a problem with Oprah. Although apparently Monique said some bad stuff about Oprah. But it's really not a good look. And I think that, you know, maybe the debate shouldn't be, I think, I think that it's just so shocking. And I think that probably at the time that it happened, these actors didn't know what to say because again, it was so shocking. Um, and they probably wanted to, they didn't want to have any repercussions while they were filming, but now the movie's released. So it's too late for that. So I think they're speaking up, but it's just, it's very bad. Uh, and I think that, uh, as I said on Movie Math yesterday, uh, I think it's hurting the film, but perhaps that's what needs to happen so that this stops. You know, uh, maybe some people need to be brave and step forward because, you know, nobody ever does anything for the right reasons. We've talked about this. It's an unfortunate reality in life. They started only doing diversification in Hollywood because the audience became more diverse and they found out they can make a lot of money doing it. And so that's the only reason they eventually did it. Or sometimes, you know, you know, when they started doing like, uh, you know, after Exodus and they started to, they start, everybody was white and British in period pieces and even like about the Bible. And they weren't doing the correct casting for the region. But then people just decided to finally stop going. And only then did Hollywood change. And so if you're going to get people to act properly, studios and companies to act properly on set, the only way you're going to get them to do it is if they are fearful that they're going to get called out down the line. And so I hope this isn't a sacrifice that these actresses are making. I hope that they continue to work because that would be awful. Uh, but, um, you know, I worry about because of what happened to Ray Fisher. But somebody has to speak up just so that this stops happening. And I think that it's very brave of them to do it because, you know, this isn't just like, you know, I've told you like before, like Henry Cavill being like, why don't I have a great big trailer like Ben Affleck? Fine, that's like, that's one thing. But this is just really horrible. And again, it's something that's industry standard. It's not pampering. I mean, you might be like, oh, I saw someone say, oh, what, they didn't get a latte? Well, if everyone else is getting a goddamn latte, you sure as heck are gonna want yours. That's the way it goes. If everybody else, and when you start to see a pattern as to who isn't getting a latte, it becomes even more offensive. You're like, wait a minute. Is it really just this one group? 
and then something has to be done about it. I gotta tell you, I have a very hard time even comprehending that you wouldn't give everybody a latte, especially when they're all standing in the same room. I'd be like, I think you miss some people. Like, it's just crazy to me. And I think that that's another thing. That's really interesting. I'm really, you know, that's, I think, you know, being on social media has really opened my eyes over the years to a lot of different scenarios and things that are happening. And that when I hear politicians having conversations, I'm like, man, you got to get on social media. You got to get out there. You got to expand your horizons. Because we wouldn't even know that this was possible if Taraji P. Henson and Danielle Brooks didn't speak up. Because again, I told you, this to me before hearing this would have been inconceivable. They were like, what if we just give actors keys to a rental car and tell them to drive themselves? I would have laughed because I'd be like, good one, because that would never happen. And now to hear that it actually happened to, um, to multiple people on a multi-million dollar production is shocking. And to also hear, sadly, that actors of color, and particularly female actors, have had to deal with this for decades is just horrible. And I'm glad, you know, you know, I think one of the things they say is that the best thing that you can do to protect your abuser is to stay quiet. And I got to tell you, this has illustrated that to, this to me the best to date. You know, like, I just, you know, I really feel that is a good way to describe this. CC says, they keep saying industry standard. How do we know they didn't hire set managers with little to no experience, like when they hired DaCosta? Uh, no. So, I think there are so many people who work on a film that somebody should have said, and you know, certainly they're not going to be that inexperienced on a $100 million production. Somebody would have said, where are the cars? Where are the drivers? Also, you have to say no to the Teamsters. Do you know who drives the cars for the cast? It's the mob. <laughs> It's Jimmy Hoffa. So they really are very, very, very protective of that gig. So they had to actually go and say to the Teamsters, we don't need you on this movie, or I mean, at least to the regard that we usually would, because they still had to drive the prop trucks and stuff like that. But they actually had to say, no, no, we don't need drivers for the cast. Steven says, I hope Taraji doesn't get blacklisted like Oprah did with Monique. A lot of black actresses like Halle Berry have come out in support of Taraji and expressed sharing similar struggles. Well, I think there's safety in numbers. <clears throat> and maybe that's one of the reasons that Danielle Brooks brought this up. So it's not always Taraji. That's another great point. Because, you know, I think some of us were like, why is it always Taraji? So I think that's great that other people were like, it's not just Taraji. Only Taraji is brave enough to say something. Man, I'm getting the feels. I want Taraji to have all the flowers because she's been just so horribly disrespected. But I think she desperately needs a, man a manager, an agent, and a publicist. But just a good one. She should just interview them. <clears throat> Platinum Diva says Monique said it, Viola said it, Lupita said it, and she said it. I, I, I mean, I'm familiar, I'm, well, now I'm familiar with Monique's comments, but I didn't remember Viola talking about mistreatment on set. Although I do hear, I remember Viola saying like some shockingly bad things about how she was addressed by a producer, which I just thought was, again, just shocking. And I think it's important to understand sometimes that what happens to some people might be outside the realm of what you would expect. And that's the same thing um, that I think with politics and discussing some of the things that have been in, in the news lately. All right, so I think let's go to the Q&A section. <clears throat> let's hope this stuff is all fixed. Okay. <clears throat> Big Witch says, did the studio not think this would be a bad look? Well, you know, Big Witch, here's what's really horrible about it. I think they felt no one would ever say anything. And they would get away with it. Oh, I'm making myself sad but I'm not as sad as Taraji and everybody on that set. All right, so let's go to the Q&A. And that's why it's important to support them. 
I loved talking to you about this. This was great. So important to talk things out. All right, Q&A time. Woohoo! we're in an hour and a half, baby. <laughs> Woo! Go forever. Uh, oh, the Globes ratings came in. Let's see. I need perspective on that, though. I don't see no Globes ratings. Where are you seeing that? I don't see that. All right, let's go to the Q and A. Danielle Harati says, uh, Daniel says, Grace, who was your favorite presenting duo last night? I love John Batiste and Andre, Audre Day. Uh, they were good. I guess my favorite were Carrie Russell and Ray Romano. I thought that was a good bit, and they were both very funny. I'm, and it was a good bit and that it was fair and even-handed. They both got to be funny, which I appreciate. Oftentimes, women are stuck in the straight role, not being com the comedic. You know, there's a straight man and a funny man in any comedic duo. And so often, women are stuck doing the straight role. So I was really happy that she got to be really funny. Sensation says, what happened to your hobby of playing golf? Oh, I messed my hands up so badly, and I just haven't had a chance. But I'm like, I got to get some gloves if I'm going to play golf again. Bye, C-Class. Shay says, do you think Taraji stained the movie? I'm sure it's getting nothing this award season. Uh, well, I think that it was not going to do, it wasn't, it, I mean, the writing was on the wall pretty quickly. And I don't think she's, I think that she, I think it was a necessary stain. Because uh, it's a shame that it happened on this movie. Uh, that's, uh, don't, don't blame Taraji. Blame the people who made the movie for putting the cast in that situation on a film about abuse. Let's see here. The guy Ty says, Ray Fisher should rally up with this group, especially since this is the same, that's a good point. Oh my God, it is the same studio where he took mistreatment from. Yee, yikes. If I were Warner Brothers, I would consider just maybe putting all these people in a movie together and just being like, I just, you can't take any more bad publicity. Because uh, this is like, that's really bad. Let's see. Uh, Danny, um, I will be doing a spoiler review of Echo because the review embargo, as I said yesterday or the other day, lifts um, just when the show drops. So it's, you know, you guys are already going to be watching the show. So I'm going to go right to a spoiler as fast as I can. Oh, Sergio, the Stranger Things show in London was good. That's fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that. Mr. Fancy Pants says, don't the unions handle these sorts of complaints? Ah. Uh, I don't know if the union would feel this was a serious enough complaint for them to get involved, sadly. You know, I think in Hollywood there's a lot of pick your battles, but if it's always not picking the same battle, then it becomes a problem. Riley Steele says, Grace, do you think Hollywood's occasional disdain of the audience is why some great actors become disenchanted by the industry? Angelina Jolie becomes to mine, and even Cameron Diaz. I don't think that's it. I think that the reason that some actors become disenchanted is that Hollywood is very cliquish. And sometimes it can be really emotionally draining to keep having disappointments. You know, Hollywood is a lot of not only talent, but also luck and who you know. And so sometimes if you have a bad run, uh, it can, you just might need a break. You know, and especially when you've made enough money that you don't need to come back, maybe sometimes you don't come back. But I think that that's partly sometimes what it is, that, you know, you just, Hollywood, you know, you can't just do whatever you want in Hollywood. It's a team effort, for better or worse. Uh, and so sometimes it can be very frustrating to be on those teams, or you find yourself no longer on the team. And I think that's where that starts to happen. Blair Wraith, I haven't heard anything about Tatiana Maslany with Hulk, She-Hulk. And I would think to get rid of her would be nuts, so I can't imagine that happening. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Oh, Adam Byer says, hi, Grace. Sorry I'm late. I hope you're having a great day. Weird question. Any idea what happened with Daddy Pedro and his arm? No, I don't. I hope he's okay. Uh, all I could think of was his already jam-packed shooting schedule. And I was like, oh, no, he can't take any more delays. He's already got so much stuff that he needs to do. All right, let's see here. Catching back up. Thanks for gifting a membership, Dancing Dog 60. Paul Brunel says, do you think Dune 2 could break 600 million? I feel like with COVID not being a factor in no day and date, it has a chance. I got to see the reviews and I got to see the movie for myself, Paul. Right now, I think that would be a bit of a stretch because uh, I think a lot of people didn't enjoy the film when they watched it at home on Max. So, uh, but uh, let's see how desperate we all are for a big movie when March 1st rolls around. That's going to be a big part of it too. Hold on. Oh, Dancing Dog 60, another membership. Thank you. It's Killian Mac for sure. It's Killian because some people are swearing it's Cillian. I can't get a straight answer on this thing. I'm going to have to go look one of his interviews again. Zay, I did go over Emma Stone's win, and I decided to leave it at the fact that I love her as a person, and I just want good things for her. Yay. <laughs> All right. Sensation says, what are the chances of Barbie getting a sequel after last night's Golden Globes performance? I would say it actually probably decreased it. If I were involved with Barbie uh, after last night, I'd be like, I don't know if I want to stay on this because people aren't loving it. So the party might be over. That's kind of how I felt, you know, like Barbie was a party, <clears throat> but maybe the party's over. A big, a big skill in life is knowing when the party is over. The Snyderverse failed that test. They stayed way too long at that party. And I, now I'm feeling that, you know, even I, as a mega Barbie fan, I'm like, you know, the party might be over. I think we should all abandon ship. So before, while I was very much in favor of a Ken movie, now I'm like, mm, I don't know, man. Or at least I wouldn't decide right now. Maybe it'll become unpopular and then bounce back. That's right, Steven. The, the Marvels is hitting digital on January 16th, and it's not that bad a movie. I think it's perfectly fine. Vincent, I don't know when they're going to have Harley Quinn season five. It takes a long time to do um, animation, unfortunately. Like, who knows when Blue-Eyed Samurai is going to return. It's so unfair. I want it now. That's right, Platinum, D Platinum Diva. Cat Williams said a lot of truth. That's why his interview blew up. He was, he was spitting facts. He said Hollywood has who they like and who they don't like, and that's very true. Uh, Miguel says, hi, Grace. You sent a video you were hoping. But that's true of any business, by the way. Life is clickish. Miguel Alison says, Hey Grace, you said in a video you were hoping they changed something from Joker 2 but didn't say what it was so not to spoil it. When the movie comes out, if they include it or not, will you let us know? I will for sure, Miguel. Definitely, and I love you too. Isaac says, Grace, shout out from Brazil. Brazil, my first time here. I'm super excited. Hooray! Genuine question. What's the difference between the awards? Global, Golden Globes and Emmys? I truly don't get it. That's a great question. Well, they're different organizations. So the Emmys is just for television, whereas the Golden Globes is for film and TV. So, and it's also like the Emmys are its own thing in the TV space, just like the Grammys are music. But the Golden Globes is part of the march to Oscar. So that's the difference. Care Bear says, Grace, are you a fan of Yorgos Lanthimos' other work? Since you didn't like Poor Things, uh, you don't like Poor Things, but you love The Favorite. I gotta tell you, I'm not a fan of Lord Yorgos Lanthimos's work. I saw the favorite, but I didn't, I didn't hate it. Like I hate poor things. I was just like, eh, not for me. Uh, but so I, I think it's pretty clear that like uh, Ari Aster, Yorg and they're, they're they team them up in those that directors on directors series for Variety, which I thought was brilliant. Uh, I'm just Yorgos Lanthimos is not for me. Let's see here. Michael, I don't know about more merch. I got to think about it. It's a big endeavor to make merch, actually. Da, da, da. Mr. Real Shane says, a year today. Love movie math with dinner every Sunday. Ah, it's a date, Mr. Real Shane. I love it. Thanks for making me a part of your, sun your Sundays. That makes, means so much to me. 
Okay, it is Killian. All right, I'll remember it. Uh, Jake Van Norden, I haven't listened to any of the Mean Girls music. I want to be surprised when I come in and see it. Uh, I'm seeing it tomorrow. I'm way behind here on the comments. Uh, Grace, which stream was it when you explained what is, who was included as an actor's team? I don't remember which stream it was in. I do a lot of streams. But yeah, they employ a lot of people. They're little businesses. Taraji was talking about that too. She was saying she only takes home about 20% of her pay, which uh, is scary, but probably true when you factor in taxes. I'm not saying she has to rehire everybody, but she needs to rehire some people. Rodney Dollar says, Barbie is not dead yet. I hope you're right, Rodney. I hope you're right. We'll know soon, though. We'll know with Critics' Choice, and then as soon as one Guild Award comes on, on, uh, on, the, on the boards, we'll have a better idea. Isaac, I got your question. I'm glad, but I see you asked it again. Nice caller you got there. Finn Moreau says, Hey, Grace is an Irish person. I can confirm Mac is correct. Killian is pronounced Killian. Barry's name is pronounced Keoin. Ah, who would ever get that? And uh, Donald Gleason is Donald. All right, I'll try to remember this. <laughs> Why do you put letters in there that Don't said? Let's see here. I know Dory does voices. Echo starts tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tonight, I can tweet about it at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll wear pink for Mean Girls for sure, Sean. At least I'm planning on it. I hope I don't forget. I have a very crazy day on Wednesday. Steven, I, don't, I have to know what Golden Globes viewership was like before last year because last year it was still very much admired in controversy. Writer Boy says, would you ever consider doing a video of the Cat Williams interview? No, I don't want to. Cat Williams feels he, he's, he's out. Like, I don't know. Thank you. I mean, Cat Williams, it was glorious, but I, I don't want to comment on that. Uh, Isaac, I will cover The Last Airbender. I'm going to be asking for screeners soon, but it's still a little bit too early. Enrique says, do you like Chelsea Handler as the host of the Critics' Choice Awards? Well, I love seeing a woman host always, so that's great. Although seeing your question reminded me that she actually, I think, dated Joe Coy, who was the host of the Golden Globes. I'm sure she's going to make a joke about that. I know how to pronounce Saoirse Ronan's name, Fact fiction fan. I, I learned that, Saoirse Ronan. Sean, if you haven't heard about the Cat Williams interview, spelled with a K, actually, he is a comedian who's kind of outside Hollywood, uh, Hollywood circles, but still very successful. And he was on uh, a YouTube uh, podcast but with video component, and he just burned everything to the ground. He had all the receipts. He just was naming names, taking no prisoners. And it was just an incredible interview that trended for hours. And so everybody's checked it out, and it's, a, it's like a, it's a big deal. Danny, I will definitely break down the Emmys. I'll do a live tweet of the Emmys next Monday, and I'll be covering them the day after on a live stream. Brad McDonald says, I'm flying to New York today from Australia. I haven't been uh, in winter before. Suggestions to do or see. Lincoln AMC Square is good, right? Pretty excited. Well, Brad, all the tourist stuff is still the big winners. You know, whatever you've seen in a movie about New York, it's good to do. But yes, AMC Lincoln Square has the best screens in the city. Great theater. All right, let me do shout outs, because uh, it's almost two hours. Wow, this is the longest stream I've ever done. All right, what are you guys up to? What are you doing, just so I can say hi? And thank you so many, I see so many of you tuned in. 
I, I really appreciate it. Even if you can't be a member, I love uh, you keeping me company and talking to me about this. Uh, and so it's very nice to have you here. Hey, Ben Pello, I'm glad to keep you company at work. My pleasure. Daniel Harati is eating a Snickers in Scotland. Nice alliteration there. Uh, let's see here. Alex Alfaro is at the gym. Well, Big Witch is working on their embroidery project in Seattle. Nice use of emojis. Elliot Bullock just got finished doing the laundry. I'm glad you finished it. Uh, fiction fan, I'm glad you like the long stream. This is a very long stream. This is almost two hours. I usually am only about an hour. Rashad says, supposed to be napping before work, but I couldn't miss this live stream. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you feel it was worth, worthy of skipping a nap. Uh, let's see here. Pastor Madeline says, just got home, unwrapping my Nutribullet. <laughs> That's great. Great purchase. Looking forward to a breakfast smoothie tomorrow. Love it. Luis, I do have Boop and Boom Baby merch. It's using these emojis, actually. CJ says, finishing up work at home. Hi, neighbor. Hi, neighbor, fellow New Yorker. Michael McKenna says, going to get a latte in Chicago. You get your latte, Michael. You get it yourself, goddammit. Oh, Nicole Sullivan is organizing her Disney Lorcana cards. I'm not big into card games, but those cards are beautiful from what I've seen. Paul Brunel says, just moved into a brand new apartment and enjoying the dishwasher and fireplace. Oh, someone's moving on up. I love it. <clears throat> fireplace is pretty sweet. Hey, Fabby, thanks for joining. Albert Diaz says, hi from Bogota, Colombia. It's a holiday, but working. Oh, but you've kept me company with the Golden Globe craze. I'm glad I could make it a little more fun, even though you're stuck working. Well, Alejandro is also working. Um, is that the Czech Republic, Alejandro? Is that what CR means? Jiko says, about to get ready for meeting up with my friend tonight who I haven't seen since last year. Ah, reunion, I love it. And Pixie Mermaid says, eating dinner, baked salmon, sliced avocado, and pickled radish. Ah, Pixie Mermaid, we eat the same. Although I don't like pickled stuff. But I, I eat a lot of avocado and salmon. It's good for you. And, and you're, that's awesome. Oh, look, Aided Buffalo is shaving. I love that. That's great. Elise says, watching Netflix Daredevil and getting ready for Echo. I cannot comment on that until 11 o'clock. Hey, Danny, always great to hear from you in Guatemala. Guatemala, love you too. And Dancing Dog 60 says, at work in Boston, thinking about my commute home soon. Ah, drive safe, or however you're getting home. And Danny Dumphy says, I'm looking up the Mediterranean diet per your recommendation. Strong recommendation. I really, I think it'll change your life, everybody. I told you I'm like a, an evangelist, but with the Mediterranean diet. Hey, friend, have you heard of the Mediterranean diet? <clears throat> it'll change your life. Alejandro, 3 p.m. in San Jose. Oh, that's great. And D. Thomas is wrapping up work in Arlington, Virginia. Well, writer boy is eating bacon and drinking. <laughs> Live it up, writer boy. That's hilarious. All right, everybody. Oh, Tammy, I hope you feel better soon. I'm glad we were able to keep you company. All right, I better get going. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for the live stream. We had a great time. Thanks for the supersized live stream, and I'll see you, see you tomorrow. Okay, everybody, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.